Hello, my name is Scott Kidder, and thank you for joining me today. I'm a staff software engineer at MUX in San Francisco, and today I'll be sharing with you our experiences with tuning the Flink file system plugins for state persistence. Here's the agenda for the talk. I'll begin with a quick background on MUX to give you some context about what we do. Then I'll talk about some of the Flink applications that we've developed and that we've continued to run over, over, uh, over the last few years. Then I'll provide an explanation of what state persistence is for Flink applications and why it's important. Then I'll talk about our experiences using different state persistence backends, namely HDFS, Google Cloud Storage, and AWS S3. Lastly, I'll wrap up with some conclusions about our experiences and uh, if we have the opportunity over the, uh, the Flink Virtual Conference, the opportunity to take questions, I'd love to take questions. So some quick background on MUX to give you some context about what we do. So in 2016, we launched MUX Data, which is an analytic service for video. Uh, provides insights into quality of experience issues. So we have uh, historical analytic analytics data as well as a real-time dashboard that our customers use to see what's actually happening for all the different video playback sessions that are active at this moment. Some of our customers include CBS Interactive, PBS, Vimeo, Livestream, and many more. We also have Mux Video Service, which launched in early 2018. It provides a REST API for ingesting video and serving it uh, easily over multiple CDNs. Uh, you just need to give us a link to the source video or initiate a live stream and you're good to go. So, um, quick bio about myself. So, so my name is Scott Kitter. I'm, like I said, staff software engineer at MUX. Uh, joined in 2016 and it was that same year, 2016, when I was introduced to Apache Flink when we were looking for a stream processing platform to support some alerting features that we want to build into MUX data. I spoke at uh, the 2017 Flink Forward about that very subject, and I'm happy to be back here again. So how do we use Apache Flink? So uh, we've got MUX data apps, uh, primarily around uh, alerting that run in AWS uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, that alerting app analyzes video views for spikes and error rates that could be an indication of a widespread problem for a customer property and that application manages the alert incident lifecycle uh, for an alert. And it, that application also keeps uh, track of historical error rates uh, to provide context about what we're currently seeing in terms of error rates in relation to uh, what we've seen in the past. We've also got Flink apps that we developed for our MUX video service. Uh, the first one is Log Enrichment. So we get CDN logs from all of our different uh, CDN partners and we enrich those logs with information about the corresponding video asset, uh, as well as information about the encoding settings that were used, uh, network information and geographic information for the client that initiated the request. So every uh, Flink task manager also has a transient uh, cache of many of those details uh, to avoid repeated lookups. The only state that the log enrichment app really needs to persist is its position in the Kafka stream source uh, topic offsets. And then we've also got a media usage processor application, which runs in Google and Kubernetes. Um, and it takes the enriched CDN log records and it accumulates uh, totals in terms of seconds of video delivered or bytes delivered uh, across a number of different breakdowns. And so that application has uh, many different operators that accumulate these stats in hourly tumbling windows which are then periodically written to Postgres. So the state itself, in total, doesn't amount to a huge amount of data, uh, but we have a very large number of operators, which uh, will become relevant, uh, as you'll see later in the talk. So a quick comparison of the applications that we run. So alerting has medium record throughput, low number of operators, uh, but very large state, many, many gigabytes, uh, because it has to retain information about active alerting incidents as well as historical data about uh, error rates that we've seen over time. Log enrichment uh, has high record throughput because every CDN log record must, must be enriched, uh, low number of operators, and low state. And then lastly, media usage processor has high record throughput because it's working on all those enriched log records, very high number of operators, and a medium-sized state. So. What do I mean by state persistence? So nearly all Flink streaming applications have some sort of state. That could be transient state in the case of a, a cache that can just be rebuilt if the application is resubmitted or restarted. Uh, but there's also state that is subject to 
that could lead to like significant data loss if it's not uh, periodically written to um, a state backend. And so Flink applications usually use a, a technique called checkpointing that's built into Flink, um, and that's a method for recording application state in durable storage. So this guards against machine failure, it guards against application failure, um, and it also allows for changes in a job's parallelism. So you can uh, save point a job and uh, resubmit it with a different level of parallelism to increase or decrease the amount of resources. You can also use save pointing to um, move clusters or upgrade the application. Um, and so state persistence is very important. It's critical to all Flink applications. So let's look at some of the state backends that you can actually use to save state. Um, so obviously any production system, you'd want to ensure that you're using a highly available, durable uh, state backend. Some of the most popular ones are HDFS, S3 from Amazon, GCS from Google Cloud, and NFS. So let's talk about HDFS first. So HDFS is the first state backend that we used at Mux um, when we began using Flink. It seemed easy enough to set up. Uh, we just created a name node, a secondary name node, and three data nodes to provide redundancy. Um, we ended up having a lot of production issues around HDFS, and most of them were concentrated in our Google Cloud uh, deployment of HDFS, which seemed really strange um, since our both our Google Cloud and AWS deployments of HDFS were using the exact same uh, configuration and version of HDFS. Um, with the same versions of Flink, uh, it really wasn't clear. Um, the primary differences will become obvious later uh, was the applications that we were running um, in those clusters. That has a significant effect, but that wasn't immediately obvious to us at the time. Uh, and the main issues that we had with HDFS as a state backend was uh, with the HDFS cluster reporting under replicated blocks. So uh, HDFS ensures that uh, data is replicated across a configurable number of data nodes for it to be considered uh, written durably. And Flink also ensures that data has been written durably before it uh, allows the application to continue advancing along. Otherwise, uh, if you write to HDFS but it, the data is not really written, um, then you could end up in a situation where you need to restore from a checkpoint and that data is not there, it can't be written. So Flink is, is doing the right thing by halting processing when HDFS or any durable storage system um, is not able to ensure that the data is actually there. So uh, the exceptions that we would see in the Flink apps were um, an indication that uh, data nodes were running but not available, HDFS logs would indicate that uh, data blocks could not be written or replicated. Um, and this was kind of a cryptic situation. We ended up experiencing a lot of alert fatigue. Um, none of us on the team were HDFS experts. Really, the majority of our experience with HDFS was in supporting this HDFS cluster that we created just for Flink. Um, and our solutions tended to be turned off, turned on again. None of us wanted to be experts on HDFS. We had other problems that we really needed to solve. And so this was really starting to annoy us. And we may have figuratively or literally flipped tables. I don't know, but it was very frustrating. So that brings me to Google Cloud Storage. So in October 2019, I switched our Flink clusters and Google Cloud over to using GCS for state persistence instead of HDFS. So GCS is highly available. Um, we had been using GCS for storing video data and it had performed really well. Might as well use it for Flink as well. So I use the, uh, the Google HDFS GCS connector, which allows Flink to interact with GCS uh, as if it were a Hadoop file system. It's a beautiful abstraction and it sounds great. Um, so it's just a matter of adding a core site XML file to the Flink um, uh, configuration path, uh, Flink Home Etsy. So Flink will automatically look for that file when it needs to interact with a Hadoop file system. Um, and in that core site XML file, we call out the uh, Google Cloud uh, Hadoop uh, GCS connector. 
uh, for handling GS URIs. We also um, indicate that we want to use uh, GCS authentication via a JSON file that gets mounted into the Flink Docker container. Uh, keep in mind we're running in Kubernetes, so we mount a Kubernetes secret with the that has JSON encoded data with our GCS uh, secret into the Flink Docker uh, container, and then Flink is able to make use of that when it needs to eventually authenticate to GCS. And so it's really just those three settings uh, that are needed to really get you off and running. So um, and I wish I could say that that's where the story ended and GCS worked fine, um, but that simply wasn't the case. Uh, we no longer had HDFS errors, true, um, but we also saw check, checkpoint duration increase significantly, um, which would actually lead to jobs restarting because the checkpoint wasn't completing quickly enough um, with our configured checkpoint frequency. So uh, what was also weird was we saw this occur with um, relatively small state, like only uh, 10 megabytes of state. So it was like, why is it taking so long for this state to be written to GCS? So I experimented with uh, several different GCS tuning parameters, most of them related to uh, caching, uh, metadata that's, that's, re that's returned by GCS from GCS API calls. Um, also increased the GCS buffer in, in case that was an issue. None of these settings really solved anything, um, but eventually solved it um, by finding out that the bottleneck was resulting from writing many, many small files all at once. Uh, Stephen Wu from Netflix has uh, spoken about this as well uh, at Flink Forward San Francisco 2018 um, in the context of S3. What's interesting is it's not really just related to S3. There are a lot of uh, HA distributed file systems that are really optimized for read access and less so for write access. So in this case, um, what was happening was the Flink task managers particularly for our media usage processor application, there are hundreds and hundreds of operators, stateful operators, that would all try to write their state at the exact same time. And this would lead to rate limiting at the GCS level. Um, and that ended up uh, causing these checkpoint operations to take a very long time. So what we ended up doing was exactly what uh, Netflix has done, which is increase the state backend thresholds, uh, which is the minimum amount of data um, for a to trigger a task manager writing state directly to um, the state backend. And those default values are surprisingly low. Um, so here are the default values. So uh, by default, um, if a stateful operator has state that is um, more than 1K, um, it will attempt to write that that data directly to HDFS or GCS or S3 or whatever. And so that was the case for the vast majority of the operators. And so you've got hundreds of writes trying to happen all at once. Um, by increasing those thresholds, the task manager would most often ship the, the state to the job manager, where the job manager would then batch it all up and then write one large, um, one or a couple uh, large state files to GCS. That um, was a pretty easy change, and it had significant uh, results that um, are pretty obvious right here. So it significantly lowered checkpoint duration just by modifying those settings. Went from you know, 15, 20 seconds for a job to one second or two seconds. Um, it was really amazing. And it also resulted in fewer GCS API calls. You can see the exact same effect here. What was surprising was that it also led to lower CPU usage on the job manager and the task managers. So this was kind of surprising. Um, you'll also see the heat memory usage decreased on both of those deployments. So why did CPU usage drop from changing how we're writing state, uh, state to uh, the state backend? So the GCS connector uses a default upload chunk buffer of 64 megabytes. So when that GCS connector doesn't know the size of the data that needs to be written in advance, it allocates 64 megabytes from the heap uh, for every file that needs to be written. 
Now, if you've got a task manager that needs to write a hundred different files, all of them actually fairly small, um, to GCS, it's going to allocate 64 megabytes times 100 um, every time a checkpoint operation needs to happen. And so this was led to a lot of uh, heat memory ha uh, thrashing where the task manager and the job manager would have to allocate huge amounts of memory from the heap and then eventually that would have to get garbage collected. So this created a lot of uh, garbage collection pressure on the JVM and that drove up CPU usage as well as heat memory usage. Um, and in many cases actually led to task managers ooming, um, which was, as you might imagine, not good. So when there are hundreds of thousands of files being written, you don't want um, heat memory thrashing. Um, we also we increased the, uh, the heat memory that we allocated for the job manager, uh, just to ensure that as it's collecting all the state from the task managers, it has additional memory to work with. So as far as what we did for Amazon Web Services S3 integration, we still had our Mux data alerting application running in AWS, uh, still writing to HDFS, and we really wanted to just be done with HDFS and make use of S3, uh, similar to how we um, had moved over to GCS. So uh, we looked into what it would take. Uh, it's just a matter of building the Flink S3 FS Hadoop file system package that's part of Flink. So we use Flink 1.9.1 in all of our deployments, and we build uh, Flink Docker images for all of our deployments. Um, so during that build process, we just build this additional package, as well as uh, overriding the core side XML file. Um, and we use the S3A file system adapter that's part of HDFS to interact with S3. So one thing that's important to note is that when you've got an application that's running in an AWS private subnet, that if you use the default S3 endpoint, um, that all of your interaction with S3, and same is true for Kinesis, all of your interaction with S3 will uh, be subject to NAT traversal. And that AWS uh, charges for all the data that traverses the, the NAT. And so you can avoid that those costs by creating a NAT gateway. So the NAT gateway needs to be configured as your S3 endpoint. And the way that you do that is by setting the fs.s3a endpoint property in your HDFS core side XML file that is made available to the Flink application. So just create a NAT, be sure to create a NAT gateway, set that property. Um, and then, so the, the three settings that we had to use for uh, using the S3 uh, state backend were uh, setting the Hadoop S3 connector class, specifying a buffer directory lo location as slash temp, uh, which made sense for the uh, Docker containers that we run Flink in, and then also specifying the NAT gateway. So in conclusion, uh, HDFS connectors are a great way uh, for Flink applications to be able to interact with uh, proven uh, storage systems from cloud providers that includes GCS and S3, um, and that it's extremely important that you pay attention to the number of stateful operators in your application and the size of state that they need to persist. Uh, that has a huge impact on uh, checkpoint and save point performance. And that you should set uh, those thresholds appropriately for your use case. Uh, those settings for the state uh, thresholds are in the advanced settings, but I, I kind of question whether or not they should be in advanced settings because they have such an important role in uh, state persistence. Um, I think they should be something that every, uh, every organization that's deploying Flink uh, evaluate for their use case. And then if you're using S3, be sure to set a NAT gateway to avoid NAT traversal. And one thing that's absolutely critical, I'm sure a lot of you already do this, I hope so, is that you have your Flink applications instrumented with metrics. Um, use Prometheus, use Grafana, it's so important to be able to see that evidence that the changes that you're making are having the intended effect or not um, as you're doing this tuning. So lastly, thank you. Um, thank you again for your time. Um, I hope that uh, you're able to get a lot of use out of this information and I'd, I'd love to take questions.